Hey folks, I'm Eddie G, DM Fumble, and this is another episode of Fumbling Around, where I look at all things related to Dungeons and Dragons, Dragonlance, or whatever else interests me at the moment. And today, I want to talk about money. No, not all the cash that we spend on this hobby, from the books, minis, to the dice and paints. No, not that kind of money. Today, I want to talk about the currency of the realm. The realm being, of course, the Dragonlance setting and the continent of Ancelon. It's important to remember that Dragonlance was only the second setting created for the D&D game after Greyhawk. Now, you might argue Blackmoor, but eventually Blackmoor just gets merged with Greyhawk. So Dragonlance is the second one specifically stated to be its own setting. When the designers were creating the setting, they wanted to do some things different. And as I mentioned in a previous recording, and there's a link somewhere up here, they changed a lot of the creatures. And that video shows you what creatures are specific to Dragonlance and what general purpose creatures or common creatures are not found in the Dragonlance setting. The monetary system was another way the world of Kryn was set apart from Greyhawk. Now let's look at the Dragonlance currency through the various editions. In first edition, from the Dragonlance Adventures hardback, the only details on money and coins are the following few lines. Gold, the precious metal of history, was all too common and useless for everyday living. Steel became the metal of value throughout most of the continent of Ancelon, for it was useful and practical. Soon, coins of steel became the basic trade material. It's assumed all other coins exist and maintain their standard value. Now, while steel now takes the place of gold, we would assume in the standard currency chart, there's no details on where gold falls. Does it fall completely off the chart? Is it a valueless? Or does it have some level of value, maybe, you know, less than copper? We don't know. In the second edition, and this is from the Tales from the Lance box set, we get our first exchange table. Once again, we see that steel is the standard currency, uh, and we find out exactly how devalued gold has become. It now occupies a new place somewhere in the halfway space between a copper piece and a silver piece. Additionally, we see some new coins on our currency chart with the first mention of iron and bronze pieces, taking the place of where electrum piece would usually appear. It's interesting to note that electrum pieces in Dragonlance don't seem to exist. Throughout all the editions, there's almost no mention of electrum piece as being a unit of currency, except for one small reference that I'll mention later. In third edition, we see the exact same exchange table, the same uh, levels of currency rates between the different coins, and those new coins, iron and bronze, that we saw in second edition. It's a complete copy. Now, for fourth edition, there was no Dragonlance official setting, so we have no exchange rate. For fifth edition, we finally see an exchange rate, uh, a new coin system, with the new Shadow of the Dragon Queen adventure. At first glance, this chart appears to be a random reimagining of coins of Kryn. But I think there's a very obvious reason for the new monetary system. And that is because of D&D Beyond. Now, if you're not familiar with the D&D Beyond tool, it features everything you need to create and manage a D&D character. Included with all those tools is a coin tracker. D&D Beyond uses the standard currency, names and values from the 5th edition player's handbook. And since those values can't be renamed or otherwise changed, the next best thing was to pair up Dragonlance coins with their generic counterparts. That's why we now have gold and steel at the same level, since any steel you pick up in the adventure, you would just log into your D&D Beyond character as gold. Same thing goes for bronze and silver on this chart. Now what's interesting, and again it goes back to this whole problem with Electrum, is that they could have easily put bronze in the place of Electrum, as they did in previous editions. With bronze and iron, which does, isn't even mentioned, occupying the space of two of those equal to one steel. I don't know why they didn't, and that would be uh, interesting to find out. Now let's take a little detour into an obscure article about Kryn currency. This comes from the book, More Leaves from the Inn of the Last Home. More Leaves is a book of crunchless details about Dragonlance. For DMs who want to add more flavor to Kryn, these Leaves books, which there's three of them, along with a few other books, provide plenty of in-world reports, in-world details, and descriptions 
to really help you flesh out the setting. And I hope to actually do a video on all those books in a future video. But Moore Leaves book, as I mentioned, includes an article about currency. This article appears to be written by Harold Johnson and Steve Miller, who were TSR employees at the time, and they were working on the Dragonlance setting. In fact, I suspect this may have been part of the original manuscript for the Tales of the Lance box set that was cut out probably for space consideration. While the article has some great ideas, it's also bogged down by too much complexity to make it useful for a player or DM. For example, the article proposes that a steel piece from one country might have more or less value versus a standard steel piece, um, such as a steel piece from the nation of Lemish being only worth 80% of this standard steel, while one from Thorbarden would actually be worth 125% of this standard steel. Under this system, you would have to track your coins by nation as well as by the amount. That's too much bookkeeping, even for me. And along those same lines, in one nation, a steel piece is worth 10 gold, whereas in another one, it's worth 25 gold. Okay, so now you're, you have different exchange rates between country and, and the types of coins you got from where you originally got it from. Again, I, I, I throw my hands up. This is way too much. I surrender. But as I said before, there's actually some good stuff hiding in this article, such as coin names. For example, in Salamnia, a steel piece is known as a sword, and a silver is known as a castle. You can easily add a little flavor to your games when you give a bartender a steel, and he tosses back four silver castles with your mug of ale. And other nations have unusual coins, such as garnet, tin, and even ivory. Imagine including coin names or coin types from a specific nation as a clue to where that treasure hoard originally came from. Just a little more detail to help enhance the game and possibly lead to new and unusual adventures. Finally, I want to look at the currency table I set up for my personal 5e game. Now, this is before I had access to the Shadow of the Dragon Queen module, and of course it is no way official, but it is based on official sources. Basically, I took the player's handbook currency table and the Dragonlance 3.5 currency table and merged them up as best as I could. Then I changed the coin values based on what was in the 5e player's handbook. If you haven't noticed, in 5e everything is base 10. So 10 copper pieces equal one silver piece, 10 silver pieces equal one gold, and so forth. The only exception to this, of course, is that two electrum pieces equal one gold. Since gold in the 3.5 Dragonlance setting was about halfway between silver and copper, I kept that same formula and I made one gold equal to five copper. With the table complete, I looked it over and I realized now how the coins lined up very nicely with real world US currency. So I added that first column to help my players understand the value of the Dragonlance coins with their real world counterparts that they could easily relate to. If you're new to Dragonlance, especially if you're running the Shadow of the Dragon Queen module and or using the D&D Beyond tool extensively, you might want to just keep the currency tables from that module. If you're an older player, you might want to use the charts from earlier editions, but be aware of the issues you'll run into when your players want to buy equipment from the PHB, which uses gold as the base currency. If you want a copy of my personal version of the Dragonlance currency chart, leave a comment and I'll post a link below. If you like this video, please consider hitting the like and subscribe to be notified when new content is available. If you can, please consider sharing this link with someone, another Dragonlance fan, who might be interested in this. Lastly, if you want to follow me, I'm DM Fumble, drop the E, on Twitter and Instagram. Cheers. Until next time.